Hello, everybody. Hopefully, um, welcome. I'm excited to be, uh, I guess, the first presenter. Uh, hopefully, you guys can see my screen now. It should be a, a photo that says OVA's got culture and a photo of our 17U Black Boys team blowing insulation off the floor, working together with the officials, having a little fun there. Um, culture is uh, an interesting thing. Uh, culture is a piece that uh, uh, is going to be different every single year that you have it. It's going to change in dynamic throughout your year uh, as you go. So uh, it's really a, a liquid thing, um, and you got you got to make sure that you're on top of it 24/7 uh, all the time to make sure that you're getting where you want to go. Uh, the next picture that's up there now is our 17U uh, Timo Black. Uh, girls getting their silver medal at uh, the U.S. High Performance Championships um, under Coach Matt Schnarr, uh, Matt Chung, and uh, Christina Grail. So um, I was excited to be uh, the mentor coach for that group this year uh, and really watch them try to build and grow um, a program together. And I think that those coaches together with uh, Steve Delaney and his coaching staff did an incredible job um, of taking 34 coaches and athletes to Fort Lauderdale with zero conflict. So the cohesion that they were able to build over the 10 day training camp uh, was absolutely exceptional. So uh, I may throw some examples of that in. I definitely will use some examples uh, of my past coaching experiences and uh, why I feel strongly about what it is. So uh, to get started off with here, we're gonna just a little bit of a title slide, see kind of where we're going to go uh, tonight. Uh, 50 minutes is not a long time to talk about team culture and all the things that it involves. So um, I'm going to try to get through as much as I can uh, and then talk at the end a little bit about team dysfunction uh, and discuss how uh, your knowledge of your potential uh, dysfunction can uh, can help you out on the court. So we need to first know what uh, what culture is, whether it's good or it's bad, why I feel it's so important, um, how do we establish a good culture and how do we know if we have a good culture or not? What does it look like? What does it sound like and what does it feel like? So starting off with uh, the definition, uh, team culture is very simply, uh, it's made up of the values, beliefs, attitudes uh, and behaviors that are shared by a team. Um, how people work together towards a common goal and how they treat one another. So it's no different than when we talk about uh, culture in different uh, different areas, rural culture versus urban culture, is the same thing. It's values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that are shared within a common geographic region, or in this case, a common uh, team with that common goal um, in mind. Okay, so a um, little pictogram for you there, team together, everyone achieves more. Uh, I worked with a coach a number of years ago. Um, at Western, he was the, the head coach there for a long time. And he always said, we're gonna make more progress all being on the same page, even if it's the wrong page. But when we can get all on the same page moving together, that's when we're gonna see success. Uh, and I, I think he's absolutely correct. I believe firmly that that's, that's the case. So um, the next question we had is, is it good or is it bad? Uh, I think it's quite simple. Culture is there, it exists. Uh, in some cases, it's good. In some cases, it's bad. Uh, the question is, what is the impact then on our team? If we can find a way to create good culture, uh, it's going to increase our chances of success. It doesn't guarantee success, uh, but it increases our chances of success. All right. So in a good culture, obviously, everyone's sharing the same values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. Uh, they become the norm. They become the behavior that is expected day in and day out. If we have a bad culture, and most of us have been in, in both of these scenarios at some point in time, a bad culture uh, is almost guaranteed to fail. Uh, it's dissatisfaction, uh, selfishness, hierarchy, poor attitudes, poor behaviors, and those things become the norm. So um, one of the things that I've done over the past few years is I've gotten rid of strict captains obviously in our game we have to have a captain to go take the coin toss we have to have a captain on the floor to go talk to the official but we've created a range of leadership roles uh within our programs that allows 
Uh, even the player who's not a task leader, not somebody that's on the, on the uh, court scoring points, uh, gives them the opportunity to lead in some way. So we can call them social leaders or whatever it is, and they're leading, you know, the bench. They're leading uh, in, you know, creating social environments uh, for the team. So um, trying to get away from there's a head coach, an assistant coach, uh, there is a captain, there's whatever, get rid of that hierarchy, uh, which creates a little bit of, of that attitude of selfishness. Uh, and get more into this is a team game. We all have a role. We all have um, something to contribute, regardless what our task role is on the court. So uh, the key to this is that every team has a culture. Um, you got to figure out a way to make it a good culture to increase your chances of success. Uh, this slide is through a couple photos up here for you. Uh, the photo at the top left, clearly not a good culture. Um, it says here that energy cannot be created or destroyed. They've obviously never uh, been to this meeting. Uh, people not engaged, people not paying attention to the guy who's talking. Uh, the other one, on the other hand, the cogs to the wheel, they're working together to solve the problem, uh, getting things done, arms around each other, pretty cliche, but uh, we will see that throughout. Uh, well, you'll see it throughout my slideshow, actually, when we show photos of uh, some of the teams and stuff that we've had. So. I'm trying to make sure we understand uh, exactly what creates uh, a culture. So in this case, we're looking at the anchor points. Okay, so weaknesses, um, power-based command and control. So somebody's really tar trying to take charge. Uh, look at the 1970s football style uh, dictatorship type coaching uh, versus inspiring a shared leadership where everybody's taking things into consideration everybody's being heard uh, all of those types of things um, catch people doing things wrong in a weak culture uh, catching people thing catching people doing things right uh, in a strong culture uh, that's really tough in coaching because our job is to figure out what's going wrong and fix it uh, error detection and correction is about 75 to 80 percent of our job uh, consciously though, uh, kids will do more for you if you're catching them doing things right. Um, indifference and apathy versus energized and engaged. Um, that is us as well. So obviously we want the kids to be energized and engaged. They're more likely to do that uh, if we as the coaches are energized and engaged. Uh, that was a big piece for me because I'm not naturally a super high energy guy who's you know, um, you know, bubbly and smiling all the time and all those types of things, but uh, you have to be willing to step outside your comfort zone and change. So if that's not you, uh, we have to make that, uh, that change. Focus on fixing what's wrong versus leverage, build on what's right. Um, those of you who had a chance to listen to me yesterday, we talked about using questions more uh, to get responses from athletes rather than telling them what they're doing wrong. Um, so a strong culture would be one that allows the athletes to answer some questions and lead themselves to uh, an answer rather than us telling them what's wrong all the time and uh, them just kind of listening and eventually zoning out. Uh, human nature, I think, in 2019 is to look for the worst in people. Uh, we have to fight that. We have to find a way to bring out the best in people and get them um, believing in themselves in that confidence piece. Okay, um, and then the last one on the weak side, push and punish. Um, are you pushing kids to do more? Are you pushing kids uh, to their limit? Are you punishing kids for misbehavior or the things that they do wrong? Or are you pulling new things out of kids? Are you getting them to do more because of the way that you, you work and you're actually coaching them and helping them and leading them to become better, uh, better players, better people, okay? Um, the next part uh, is how do we create a positive team culture? And uh, I threw on here the values, beliefs, attitude, and behavior again. Uh, but the key to this is everybody has to be bought in. Uh, if you have a small portion of your population bought in, so you know your six starters are all bought in and they're super excited, but nobody else is bought in because. Um, they're not getting playing time or they're not being treated the same as everybody else within your 
team structure, um, it's not going to work. So I actually, I'll go one step further than just the players being bought in. Uh, you have to have, obviously, the players all bought in. You must have all of your coaching staff bought in. Um, and in a conversation with a couple of coaches in the season planning presentation I did yesterday, uh, there was conflict between the three coaches on how to handle a uh, situation with an athlete. Uh, and they haven't even started their season yet. Uh, it's going to be really difficult to create that positive team culture uh, if those coaches can't figure out a way to at least agree to um, to move forward uh, with the same message for the kid. And it has to be consistent. You can't have one coach saying one thing, another coach saying another thing. Um, you know, that's I'll get to that a little bit more when we get to dysfunction. Um, but the players have to be bought in. The coaches have to be bought in. Right now in Ontario volleyball, the parents are probably the biggest thing, or the toughest part to get bought into um, what the team is doing. Uh, and I choose to believe that the parents are coming from a good place uh, because the parents want the best for their kid and they believe in their kid. Um, the problem is that sometimes as parents, we don't always see things for what they really are. Sometimes we th see things for the way we want them to be. Um, so you need to have some sort of clarity uh, for the parents on what the expectations are. Um, and I didn't put it in today's uh, presentation, but uh, there's two ways that uh, I will generally give, uh, go through goal setting and culture uh, creation. Uh, one way is coach led. Um, so with younger athletes, younger players, or less experienced players, maybe is a better way to word that. Um, I'll dictate, this is what we want things to look like. This is what we want things to sound like and just kind of lay everything out on the table. Uh, if there's a question, if there's a conflict, this is the person you're going to go to. So nothing's left uh, to the imagination. Whereas with my older, more experienced players, um, I made basically none of the decisions last year with our Fanshawe women's team. Uh, I kind of guided the conversation to get them to where we wanted them to be, but they came up with all of their own values, all of their own uh, behavioral norms, all of their goals, uh, as well as their process goals. So the measuring stick on how we were going to reach uh, those eventual goals. So uh, that's pretty important that they can do that. Uh, when the athletes take care of most of those pieces, that puts the onus back on them uh, for accountability, right? I can then go to them and say, hey, you know what? This is what you said you wanted to do but this is what I'm seeing in your behavior. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we're on task with what we're doing. It's not me telling them you're doing something that I asked you to do wrong. This is what you told me you want to do. So uh, it has a little bit more bite. Um, at the club level, I think that's a little more difficult because the parents do have a little more interaction uh, and try to take a little bit more control on that. So uh, trying to find a balance between the two. Uh, and again, depends on, on the group that you have. Uh, how strong they are, how experienced they are, how confident they are, uh, all those things to be taken into consideration. Uh, I put others in there because you guys all have club administrators that you have to answer to or uh, other people within your club itself. Uh, if you're a post-secondary coach, you have athletic staff and athletic directors and all that. If you're a high school coach, uh, you have principals and administrators. and So there are other people that are involved. If they're not on board with your uh, cultural goals, it's going to be very difficult to sustain that for a long period of time. You might be able to create it in a microcosm, um, but it's going to be really, really hard to maintain that over uh, multiple years. Okay, The other piece that we sometimes forget is the organizations that we work for uh, or volunteer for. So you got to look at your organizational philosophies. All of your clubs have some sort of mission statement. Some have a, a vision, um, so you need to have a look at that. Their club, your club vision and mission statement should be based on the OVAs, uh, which is on the OVA website, and then the OVAs has to be based on Volleyball Canada. So Volleyball Canada is our largest umbrella. If we're not working towards Volleyball Canada's goals, their value system, their belief system, their attitudes, uh, their behaviors, if they're not consistent all the way down to our club level, it's gonna be very, very difficult uh, for us to, to justify where we're at. 
Okay, so I believe firmly that all of those things need to be uh, in alignment. Uh, I'm not sure they always are, um, but we need to try to make sure that that is the case. Uh, if you're working with a high school team uh, or a post-secondary team, uh, every school will have a mission statement for their academics, uh, and every school will have a mission statement for their athletics. Um, so those things should be taken into consideration when you're trying to create your, your team culture. Uh, and those are justifiable pieces that you can give the, the athletes. Okay, um, just trying to check here to make sure I'm not going too fast. If anybody's asking questions, I think you guys can type questions, but I'm not 100% sure. You can't talk back to me, so I'm not going to get an answer to that. Uh, the next piece, and probably the first real piece in getting into your individual team culture, uh, is understanding your team. Too often, uh, we don't have enough time to really get to know our athletes. Uh, I think it's pretty important that we get to know them. Uh, we wanna know who they are, what motivates them, what makes them tick, uh, what other sports are they playing? You know, Do they play musical instruments? Do they have stuff going on in their lives that are contributing to different types of behaviors? Uh, all of that stuff. The better we know our athletes, the more we can tailor our culture to them. Um, you know, we talk in, in education about teaching to the individual. Uh, in coaching, it's no different. If each athlete isn't feeling like they're valued by the coach, um, you have no shot at creating a positive team culture. Um, the next thing you need to do, especially if you're taking over a team that you didn't coach last year, what is the current culture? Where are they at? Um, and I, I've gone into programs where uh, the current culture was atrocious and really trying to have to find ways uh, to get to know the kids and fix what's going on there. But every team has a starting place. Every team has a culture at the beginning of uh, their season. So what is it? Uh, what does it look like? What does it sound like? Uh, what does it feel like? Is it comfortable? Is it exciting? Is it you know, lethargic and boring? Uh, in your first training session, are kids on their phones during water breaks? Are kids, you know, for me, that would be an absolute no-go. We need to fix that piece. Um, making sure that we, we understand where we're starting at so that we can figure out where we want to go. So you can't get there in one day. Uh, we go from where we are, then we create a vision of where we want to be. Uh, this is what I want it to look like. Uh, and I'll often ask my players, you know, when... When somebody's watching us play or watching us between matches, what do you want them to see? Right? That's essentially the perceived culture uh, from the outside world. So what do you want? What does the desired culture look like, feel like, and sound like? Okay? Then you can create a plan uh, in order to bridge that gap and get you there. And knowing that things aren't going to go smoothly all the time. We're working with humans. Uh, we're working with imperfect uh, individuals. So try to find a way to create uh, a bridge in that gap uh, in order to get to the desired culture. And sometimes it takes years, uh, which is fine at the post-secondary or the high school level where we maybe have years in a program. At the club level, you may get a team for only one year. How do you create the desired culture within um, that nine-month span? So again, it's, it's not easy and there's no cookie-cutter method to do it, but uh, we've got to figure out a way. Okay, the next thing, uh, we have to look at you as an individual um, and all the individuals, I guess, in, within your program. What are the personal values? Um, you know, if family is, uh, is high on your priority list, uh, make sure family stays high on your priority list. Maybe your volleyball team becomes part of your family and extended family and you treat them as though they're, uh, they are family members. Uh, if winning is your personal life value, you just want to win that 14U Provincial Championship, uh, awesome. Uh, make sure that you're working within that. I would question that if uh, that was the case, but um, what you know, we need to figure out what are your personal life values, what are your competitive values, uh, and where do you want to go with that? So people who are with me on the weekend, uh, you guys did an activity where we actually went through, there's probably about 150 values that you could choose from. Uh, we whittled it down to six. We whittled it down to three personal life values and three competitive values uh, from which you can create your 
uh, your own personal value statement. Uh, and out of that value statement that you have personally and the values or mission statement that your clubs have, uh, you can now create uh, for yourself in that coaching context uh, your own mission statement or your own uh, coaching philosophy, if you will. All right. Um, so the biggest question now is how do we balance all that uh, in order to create the look, sound, and feelings that we desire? So starting to, to try to do things. And too often we think, um, we think around uh, doing team building activities and that's gonna solve all the problems in the world. Team building activities are great, but they don't build a culture. Uh, short term, they're fun. Uh, they may get an opportunity, give an opportunity for the athletes to get to know each other one, one another better. Um, so they're, they're certainly useful, don't get me wrong, I, I do them and I, I don't wanna take that away, but uh, that's not where culture is built. Um, culture is built from within your unit on a consistent basis, uh, day in and day out, on the court and off the court. So we gotta figure out how, uh, how that looks, okay? The next thing, once you kinda know where you wanna go and you know what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like, the next piece is you got to actually have a look at what can potentially go wrong. Um, I've spent the last 19 years, this will be my 20th season coaching, uh, and I've only ever coached one guy's team. Uh, coaching teenage girls, there's some stuff that can go wrong once in a while. Um, we got to figure out what those are ahead of time and try to head those off before they occur or cut them off as soon as we can. Uh, so that they don't end up causing bigger problems than they need to. Uh, and again, every every year something will go wrong. We're working with teenagers, we're working with young adults uh, who all have personalities, who all have things going on in their own lives. They all have their own way of doing things. Um, something is going to get in the way uh, of success if we allow it to. Okay, um, so you know, how, how can we stop it, but you're not gonna ever stop uh, dysfunction from occurring. So then how do we minimize it? How do we take care of it so that it doesn't become a bigger problem? And once we figure, well, we, you're not gonna figure that out until we get into the, the next part here. So that's that's kind of the, the formula for starting to create your culture. Um, and then the hardest part, that's the easy stuff. The hardest part is keeping everyone on the same page. Okay, once everyone's bought into what you want them to do, I have to find a way to keep them there. Okay, uh, it's way more difficult to keep people there because once you start to have a good culture, um, kids go home for Christmas or kids uh, get in the car on the uh, car ride on the way home from practice or a tournament where they maybe didn't play as well as they want to, uh, and parents start talking or the friends at school are like, oh, well, you didn't play very much. So there's all those little outside factors that we don't control um, that have the potential to uh, tear somebody off, off the same page as everyone else. Uh, and one person is not there, like I said earlier, that could potentially uh, cause that kind of grief. Okay. Um, so let's look at dysfunction now. Um, and dysfunction is interesting. You have to understand the good before you can look at actually the dysfunction. So we just walked through a whole bunch of stuff on what it should look like, the things that we can do uh, to create good. Um, now we need to start to think a little bit about a time uh, that you were involved with a successful team and the things that it felt like, sounded like, and looked like. Uh, and then think a little bit about a time when you were involved in an unsuccessful team. And again, how did it look? How did it feel? How did it sound? And what are the differences? So if if we start to look at the good versus the bad, and we've all been involved in both probably at some point in time, uh, we can start to create uh, some things that uh, define dysfunction for us. Okay, um, so we already talked about that, so knowing what could go wrong, preventing it or stopping it. The definition of dysfunction is failure to show the characteristics or fulfill the purposes accepted as normal or beneficial. So you've defined all of those things that you want to be your norm, your training norm, your norm outside the gym, uh, on the bus, in transit, 
wherever it is, you have the things that you've decided. This is what we want it to look like, sound like, feel like. Okay. Uh, dysfunction is simply the failure to, to do that. So anything that gets in the way of that. There is a pyramid um, for dysfunction. Uh, and at the top of the pyramid, so the very last thing that we worry about is the inattention to results. Okay. Uh, avoidance uh, of accountability, lack of commitment, fear of conflict. And at the base of the whole thing is an absence of trust. Okay, I am going to go through those steps with you, but if you don't have trust, you don't have anything else. You have nothing to build uh, your culture on. So uh, genuinely caring uh, for your athletes is the place to start showing them that they actually have meaning to you uh, is the place to start. So looking at trust, trust lies in the heart of functioning cohesive team. Uh, and Ernest Hemingway said the best way to find out if you can trust someone is to trust them. Uh, they will show the true colors, right? So we put our trust in, in players uh, to do their fitness when they're supposed to do their fitness, to uh, take care of one another uh, on and off the court, to uh, show up for practice on time, uh, to be prepared for practice when they get there. They also have to be able to put their trust in us as coaches uh, and trust that we have their best interest in mind, that we're going to take care of them uh, if something happens um, that is difficult, that is tough. Uh, and this is where I would say uh, there are coaches out there who have blanket, uh, blanket culture statements that are everybody must follow these things. Um, I don't believe you can do that. I think you can have a set of norms that you would like to follow, but I think every kid having different backgrounds, different things going on in their lives, uh, create a different structure or a different pathway for each of those kids. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, in my third year at Fanshawe, we had an athlete who uh, couldn't attend practice every night. Um, and there were other she was still starting and there were other players who were upset that she was starting when we had talked about uh you know we want to be at practice as often as possible and um you know my goal is everybody's there all the time obviously uh and i just had to kept saying saying to them you know you're gonna have to trust me that i have this in hand like i know what's going on i know you're upset but i can't tell you what's actually happening when we disclosed at the end of the year that the young lady had uh, cancerous tumor on the back of her eyeball that was pressing on the optic nerve and she was it was causing seizures so her season was first of all she had the, the eyeball removed the tumor scraped away uh, and then obviously the eyeball reimplanted but when we were in season her day consisted of going for cancer treatment in the morning uh, if she was feeling well she would go to school come to practice if she wasn't feeling well she was on an IV in the hospital and would miss practice uh, her stats still put her in the starting lineup, uh, all of those types of things, but she didn't want everybody to know because she didn't want to be treated differently. I think that gives gives us the leeway to go, yeah, you know what, you're not 100% of the practices, but we'll make an exception in, in this case. Um, you know, we, we talk about caring about our athletes, and I hear coaches say it all the time, do you truly care about your athlete? If your athlete is in, in difficulty, are you the one they're going to call for help? Hopefully they call their parents first, so we're on the same page. Um, but if, if they can't call their parents, their parents are unavailable, um, are you the one that they're going to call for help? So we wanna create that kind of a relationship that they trust that we have their best interests in mind. In the absence of trust, uh, your players or people will conceal weakness and mistakes. They're going to hesitate to ask for help or offer help to others, hesitate to provide constructive feedback, fail to recognize and tap into uh, one another's skills and experiences. Okay, and again, you guys have players with all kinds of different backgrounds. And then the last one is they're going to hold grudges. Um, if we can create an environment where trust exists, we can avoid some of those things. Um, just give me one second here. I'm being told that we have a question. The questions are not popping up on my screen in the, the question area. So uh, let's 
see if we can get this figured out here. Okay, I'll just continue on until Kelvin finds a way to get me that question. Um, so if we want to we want to build that trust, we want to get rid of the absence of trust and build trust. Yeah, this is where we start to see people genuinely care. Um, you know, I've spent evenings in the hospital till late at night with players. Um, if their backs were bothering them uh, at practice, uh, I've been the one that's uh, been called when uh, players are, are struggling with mental health issues. Uh, if you just slough those things off, uh, you can't build trust, right? Um, if you try to push those onto their parents or other people when they've trusted in you to, to talk to them or deal with it, um, you know, you're, you've lo you're losing that trust. Uh, be authentic and work with integrity. Uh, integrity is honesty, consistency, humbleness, uh, and selflessness. Uh, if you can do those things, then um, things will be uh, a lot easier to go. Okay, I have the question and I'm going to avoid the question for a couple seconds. I'll deal with it once I'm done uh, with trust. If that's all right, uh, it's going to have to be all right because you can't argue with me. Um, okay, they're going to embrace mistakes. We all as coaches talk about the importance of uh, making mistakes and uh, allowing uh, the kids to learn from their mistakes. If you don't make mistakes trying to do what you want them to be able to do at the end of the year, if you don't allow them to make those mistakes early in the year, okay, they're not ever going to trust that skill or their um, their ability to play. So they will make the mistakes when you don't want them to later in the year. Uh, the other thing is they'll identify and discuss openly uh, individual and team strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we want to be able to identify our strengths and our weaknesses. I always say to my teams, know more about yourself than your opponent knows about you and know more about your opponent than they know about themselves. If you can do those things, um, then confidence levels go up as well. Okay, and then the last one for this is encourage team members uh, to ask and offer help to one another. One of the best indicators that I've had of uh, good team culture uh, over the past three years with my Fanshawe women's team um, our middles have been incredible at helping one another, uh, always providing feedback to each other on uh, speed of transition, on all of those types of things, um, and really genuinely caring uh, that their, their teammates are successful on the court. So even though only two middles can be on the court and the other two middles are on the bench, the girls that are on the bench are genuinely celebrating and cheering for the girls on the court. Uh, and when the girls in the court get subbed out for the girls on the bench, uh, especially last year, we saw it in the gold medal match at OCAA Championships. Um, the girls coming out were genuinely excited that the girls going in were getting an opportunity uh, to be in that match. Okay, so if you can create that kind of environment where these things are, are happening and it's just going to make you stronger uh, as you go through, and it helps you to avoid the next thing that we'll talk about once I answer this question, which will be conflict. Uh, so the question that I have uh, is from Daryl O'Brien. Uh, the question is, what is my policy on parents in the gym during practice time? Uh, so this kind of goes back to my conversation earlier about uh, parents causing grief and all that. Personally, I've never closed the doors to the gym uh, to anybody. Uh, it's a double-edged sword because if you close the doors to the gym, the kids may actually train harder if they feel like they're not being judged by their parents. There's no question about that. Uh, it does keep the parents from knowing what's going on in your gym so they can't complain about it. Um, but it also opens you up for scrutiny. You know, what are you hiding? What, what, if you have to close the doors, uh, what are you keeping from the parents? What are you doing that you shouldn't be doing uh, in that case? It's for me, I don't close the doors, uh, although I'm running a pre tryout clinic tomorrow night and I am going to close the doors to the older uh, older kids parents for that very reason, trying to keep the parents from sizing each other up and seeing where their kid fits with the, the other athletes in the court. Um, I think the best policy there would be if we filled the parents in fully on what the plan is on what the process is. Uh, if we have the time at the end of this, I'll pull up, I'll see if I can find and pull up the document 
that I hand out to uh, our club kids uh, that just outlines everything that we do. If they're the more informed the parents are, the less they have that they can uh, complain about, right? Uh, and that leads perfectly into conflict. Um, you know, we want to make sure that conflict exists within our program. We're a competitive sport. We want to compete. We do want conflict. Conflict will make us better, but only if it's handled professionally and accurately. So first piece is by building trust, the team doesn't have to hesitate to engage in passionate debate without punishment. I've had lots of great debates with some of my players over the years. Uh, with the end of it, we can agree to disagree and we move forward. Um, you know, never, never has there been a point where, I shouldn't say never, there probably have been a couple points where uh, an athlete left saying, okay, well, he's unreasonable, he's not giving in to my wishes. Um, maybe, um, but very rarely uh, is that the case. And if you have them trusting that you have their best interest in mind, then they will leave saying, okay, yeah, you know what? He disagrees, we'll try it his way and we'll see how it goes. The flip side of that is we also have to be willing uh, to acknowledge and recognize when we're wrong, right? Um, so Napoleon Bonaparte uh, stated, the people who fear, the two fears, sorry, are not those who disagree with you, but those who disagree with you and are too cowardly to let you know. Uh, if somebody disagrees, we can have a conversation and come to a conclusion. Um, if you don't know they disagree and they're just talking about you behind your back, that's probably not the culture that you want to build uh, within your program. So then we talk about the fear of culture. When teams avoid, sorry, the fear of conflict, not the fear of culture. Uh, when teams avoid conflict, they're going to create environments where back channel politics and personal attacks thrive. They ignore controversial topics that are critical to team success. They fail to tap into everyone's opinion and perspective, and they waste valuable time. The best way to deal with conflict is to deal with it right away and head on. This is what's going on. This is what we want. Uh, what do we got to do about it? Um, it was, had an interesting scenario this year where I was coaching uh, the Madawaska women's team in the, the one volleyball league, and these are, are supposed to be professional players. Uh, my expectation of them was that they were going to be able to step on the court and deal with uh, whatever kind of adversity, conflict, things that, that occurred there. Um, what came out of it was I found out that some of the best players in the league were afraid to hurt people's feelings. They were afraid to let them know uh, that they needed the ball set higher. They were afraid to let them know that they needed the ball set faster. Uh, the setters were afraid to tell the hitters that you got to change whatever it is they got to change. Uh, and when I asked the question, I always got back, well, I, you know, we're only here for nine weeks. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Okay, I get it. Um, but we can't get better if we're not having those minor conflicts uh, and dealing with those things in an appropriate manner. Uh, hiding from the controversy will never solve the problem. Okay. So when we embrace conflict, conflict can be positive. If you can establish ground rules for engaging in conflict, of course, it depends on what type of conflict we're talking about, right? If it's significant conflict where people just do not have the same interest, you know, there, there's maybe no way to solve that problem. Um, and there, are, there is a time when you just cut your losses and uh, potentially remove player, um, you know, or there have to be consequences for uh, behaviors or whatever. Um, but First, we want to try to establish the rules for engaging in conflict. So with our 16U club team last year, um, parents were not allowed to engage in any kind of uh, conflicting conversation with the coaches. Uh, I was the lead coach, so they would come to me, and then I would go through uh, the head coaches uh, to deal with the issue. Um, so we had established ground rules, whatever that is for you. If it's go through the head coach, a lot of you have 24-hour rules. Um, those are all good. Uh, I actually sometimes like to deal with conflict in less than 24 hours because I don't want you to sugarcoat what you're talking about. Uh, give it to me straight. Uh, give it to me with your emotion, uh, whatever, and then let's deal with it. Uh, after we've both had a chance to emotionally express things, then we can maybe give it 24 hours so we can consider the other person's point of view. But if we wait 24 hours, 
uh, how is that person going to spin it at that point in time? We all know our brains are going uh, all the time trying to figure out an angle or whatever to deal with something. So that's my personal perspective is I'd rather you stand in front of me and give it to me straight. Uh, then we can walk away. I can give you my immediate re response. We can walk away. We can think about it. Then we can get back together uh, and handle that. But there's got to be some sort of established ground rules so everybody knows what's going on. Uh, acknowledge that conflict exists. Okay. Um, know that that these things are going to happen and you're going to get better results. Okay? Understand team members' natural conflict style. Some kids um, some athletes natural conflict style will be to ignore it and just internalize it um, some athletes and this would be me uh, will explode would rather get it out and uh, and talk about it right away or yell and scream about it or whatever we as coaches need to know that all of our athletes are, are different personality styles so they're going to deal with conflict naturally in a different way but they have to deal with it in their way within the established ground rules, okay? So trying to figure out a way to make that work for everybody. I uh, encourage team members to not retreat from conflicts. So some of our athletes are very passive. Uh, some of our athletes are a little more aggressive. Some of them are assertive. Uh, our more passive athletes will retreat from conflict and try to avoid it as much as they possibly can. That's the worst possible scenario for them because they will never win. It's going to always be a lose-lose for that person. Uh, we want to create a win-win situation. So if they can be assertive and stand up for themselves, they're never going to be that aggressor, um, but they can certainly speak their mind and, and hold their ground on that. Okay. Uh, recognize that productive conflict leads to commitment. Uh, if we can have the trust that's there that we can deal with the conflict effectively and efficiently, uh, we're going to end up with our commitment okay uh commitment is a lot of fun you guys all want your players to commit and we're seeing less and less commitment out of athletes uh high school especially uh where kids have other things going on that they they've got to do and they're trying to balance everything but they're not fully committed to anything um to commit is to pledge yourself to a certain purpose have a sound set of beliefs and adhere faithfully to your beliefs through your behavior. So your behaviors will always match with what your beliefs say that they are if you're committed to what you're doing. And again, it doesn't have to be sport, doesn't have to be volleyball. Um, you simply wanna stand for something or you're gonna fall for anything. Uh, persistence with a purpose is another way to word that. Uh, we wanna get where we wanna go. Um, so we have to commit to the process of getting to where we want to go. Um, a meeting I had with the 17U Black uh, kids this year, both the guys and the girls, uh, and I simply said to them, you know, you guys have more resources than any generation before you. You have everything laid out for you. You know exactly what the process is uh, to get where you want to go and to see success. But are you willing to sacrifice the things that you have to sacrifice to get where you want to go? to be successful. There are things that you have to give up in order to get there. Uh, if you see them as sacrifices, you're not going to commit. If you see them as choices and I'm choosing to go to the gym and work out rather than go to the party, that's a choice. You sacrifice your social time. If that's your feeling, you're not going to be committed to the process, right? So it's just a kind of a mindset piece uh, on how kids think. Um, or how people think, not even just kids. Uh, commitment is a big part uh, of what, what we want to get out of them. A lack of commitment is going to lead to a lack of clarity or buy-in okay, that prevents them from making decisions that they're going to stick to. It's going to breed a lack of confidence okay, and fear of failure okay, and miss opportunities to excessive uh, analysis and delay. So they get into judging rather than reflecting. Um, the lack of confidence and fear of failure. Fear of failure is a very real concept right now in our youth athletes, um, even, even in an attacking setting. So kids are trying to hit the ball. I'm watching young athletes and they're approaching so early that they have no momentum going through their takeoff and uh, attack process. 
because they're so afraid that they're going to miss the timing on the ball. So that fear of failure uh, is real. The lack of trust in uh, let's let's call you guys to the table here for a second. The coach who says, oh, yeah, you need to make errors. That's how we're going to learn. That's how we're going to get better. But then when they hit the ball into the net or out of bounds in November, we're yelling at them. If they miss the serve uh, to position one because that's what you called and they serve it to position six and we roll our eyes at them, we're instilling that feel of failure. We're instilling that lack of trust. Uh, you can't be committed if you're afraid of failing within that. Right? We talked about earlier within the trust piece, they have to create that environment where kids are okay with, with making mistakes, where kids are okay uh, with failing in order to uh, learn and grow and develop. Right? Here we are with the lack of commitment uh, being caused by uh, lack of confidence, which I believe is also caused by a fear of failure. Okay, um, we want to be able to create a consensus and clarity. So a team that commits creates clarity around the direction and the priorities. If our priority in April at Provincial Championships is to attack, put an arm swing on 95% of the balls that we send to our opponents, we have to allow failure early in the year, right? Uh, there's no way to get around that, okay? But we've created a very clear direction and priorities. We want to attack out of system, if that's the case, right? So now we have to allow them to attack out of system and fail. Hopefully, when we go from November tournament to January tournament, we see less failures. Hopefully, when we go from January to March tournaments, we see even less failures. And then hopefully, by uh, at provincial championships, you're seeing less and less, okay? So that's part of that uh, question. Okay, um, I'm going to finish this slide and then I'm going to answer another question here. Uh, a team that commits will align their entire team around the objectives, develops the ability to learn from their mistakes, okay, takes advantage of opportunities before competition does. So things that are out there that you can try to do differently uh, before anybody else does. Okay, um, question that we have uh, on the table right now is from Jeremy Booth. Uh, it is, how do you deal with conflict with parents that send an email rather than want to have the hard discussion face to face? Um, yeah, and he asks if I would state that at the beginning of the year to parents. Yeah, I, I think we live in a generation now where parents, uh, athletes, students, uh, we'll hide behind the screens a bit, uh, which is kind of ironic given that we can't see each other's faces and we're talking about cohesion. Um, I would prefer to have the face-to-face -face conversation because it takes away that security. Uh, I think we need to push our comfort zones a little bit when there's conflict. Uh, I can then get a read on how they're feeling. Um, and I'll give you an example from a teacher's perspective. Uh, I had a kid who failed a course last year who um, told his mother that he had handed a whole bunch of assignments in that weren't marked. Now, I have everything handed in electronically because I teach business. Um, so I said, sure, come on in. We'll sit down and we'll go through this stuff. Instead of telling her over email, yeah, you know what? This is what he handed in. This is what I marked where there's really no evidence. Let's come on, come on in, sit down. I opened up uh, the two different areas. They could hand stuff in electronically, showed her both of those things, and her immediate reaction is to turn to him and hold him accountable. If you can sit down with a person face to face, it's always going to solve the problem faster. Uh, I mean, it can escalate and get out of control as well at times, but both people then can get a read on the emotions of the other person to see how genuine they are over email, over text messages, uh, stuff like that. You can't you can't get a read on um, on what people are actually saying. Okay, I don't know if that's answers the question fully or not. And yes, I, I would establish that right at the beginning of the year in my documents. Okay, uh, accountability. We are, are getting close to the end here and I wanna give you guys a chance for questions. So I will fly through the last uh, couple slides here. Accountability, say what you mean, mean what you say, uh, do what you say you're going to do, uh, which is essentially integrity at its finest. 
Uh, Louis Neiser, uh, when a man points a finger at someone else, you should remember the four fingers are pointing at himself. Okay. When we avoid accountability, we create resentment among team members uh, who have different standards of performance, encourages mediocrity, uh, and places undue burden on the team leader uh, on the sole course of discipline. So uh, if we're avoiding any kind of accountability, all of the accountability then falls on those task leaders, those players who uh, are at the top um, of our scoring pyramid. The mediocrity comes from we're not going to have any kind of consistency. We're not going to be able to play at the level we want to play at. Uh, my answer to kids who get into this mode is if mediocrity is our goal, we're going to find another coach because mediocrity is not, uh, not okay with me. And that doesn't mean we have to win championships every single year, but we have to be training as hard as we can train and we want to finish as high as we can finish uh, each year. Okay. Um, you know, and then you do put that undue burden on the team leader, the person who is really trying hard to help the team get better. Uh, if they're not supported by the other teammates, uh, that's a lot of pressure on that one person. In order to develop accountability, okay, we want to publish our goals and standards. We want to lay those things out early in the year uh, and so that everybody knows what we want to do. Uh, we want to regularly discuss performance rather than the goals, okay? Um, performance is different than our goals or our standards, right? Performance leads to, hopefully, leads us in the direction of our goals and our standards, okay? And then we want progress reports. So progress reports can be, uh, I saw one of my mentor coaches when I was starting to coach uh, gave report cards. He was a former teacher and he gave report cards. Uh, after tournaments. Um, so on each of what whatever their progress goals were, I'd give them an ABC or a D. Um, you know, for me, I try to provide stats for them, something so they know they're headed in the right direction. Okay, we have a few questions coming in here. I'm actually going to hold off on the questions, get through this, and then take the last five minutes or so to, to answer those questions, uh, if that's okay. Um, team rewards. Uh, Shift away from individual awards. I'm not a fan of individual awards to begin with for a team sport. Volleyball is the consummate team sport. Uh, we win and we lose as a team. Uh, to, to provide one player with an individual award uh, essentially creates that gap, creates that hierarchy within your program. Um, not that we shouldn't be rewarding individuals for their efforts, but I think that's different than giving somebody a an individual award. Uh, we want to encourage team members to communicate regularly with one another so they're always talking, always uh, together. You guys will use uh, Team Snap or whatever the, the programs are now that are, are out there um, to get them going and get them talking. Um, in the past with our Fanshawe women's team, we just used Facebook Messenger uh, and had a group chat and everything went in there. They had one without coaches, one with coaches. Uh, every once in a while, they wrote in the wrong one, and we got to see what they were saying. Uh, but as long as they're communicating, then we can actually deal with whatever comes up and whatever's going on, and there's some accountability there. Right, the last section is the focus on results. Um, obviously, our outcome is our long-term goal. This is what we want to get to, where we want to get to, uh, the conclusion or consequences of a problem, experiment, or action. Okay, Vince Lombardi, uh, famous for saying, the achievements of an organization are the result of a combined efforts of each individual. Um, we don't win championships with one player, especially in our game. Uh, as an athlete, I'm coming uh, from a very different game. I was a high jumper, so very individualistic. Um, and I actually had no coach until I was in grade 11. So it was really, really individualistic. Uh, I choose to coach this game because it's such a great team game. It's, I would say it's probably the ultimate team game. If we uh, have an inattention to results, so we're not paying attention to results, teams who fail to keep an eye on the collective prize foster the pursuit of individual goals at the expense of team goals, uh, the focus of collective success. Um, at the youth level, I believe firmly that we should be trying to develop each individual 
to meet their individual goals within the team concept. Okay. Um, at the college, university, uh, national team, professional levels, uh, the individual goals are irrelevant. The team goals are the only things that matter. But you guys are youth development coaches. Therefore, we need to make sure that we're developing each of the youths that are within our programs. So that statement uh, can be modified slightly. Okay, focus on personal status rather than team success. Okay, so what are my stats? Um, you know, how did I do today? Why aren't I starting? I'm better than that player. Well, you know, how's the team doing? Where are we going with as a team? Okay, distraction and lack of team growth. Uh, you're not going to get better. Uh, there will be other things that, that take precedence, like passing blame, um, you know, anything that, uh, that gets in the way of progress. Okay. When we try to create a team first environment, so successful teams are going to focus on collective results. Uh, nobody's worried necessarily about individual results other than uh, their individual statistics in order to help the team get better. Okay, retain achievement oriented members. So uh, players who want to achieve a high level, they're going to stick around in programs who, um, who are looking at the team first. Um, teamwork will always result uh, in good results. Okay, and then there's the benefit uh, from individuals uh, who line up their own, uh, their own goals and interests with the bigger picture. So what's best for the team? How can I fit into uh, that team concept? Okay, so those are the five segments of team dysfunction. Uh, and again, I put this in bigger letters and uh, bolded. Uh, once everything has been brought into what you want them to do, you have to find a way to keep them there. That's the most difficult thing that we can do as coaches is maintain um, that positive culture that we wanted to have. All right, I'm going to try to answer a couple of these questions now. They're still not popping up on my screen, so Kelvin is texting them to me as we go here. Uh, question from Felix Chow. Uh, what is your advice for a new coach and a new team to build up positive culture and team? Um, step one is is get to know the players and, and genuinely care uh, about who they are and uh, what makes them tick. I think that's step one. Uh, the next thing is make sure that they understand what their roles are within the team, and that will be difficult early in the year because if you don't know the players. Um, but once you get to know your players a little more, you know who's who the best players are on the court at each position. You know who uh, is the class clown. You know who is um, you know the team mom or team dad, whatever it is, taking care of everybody all the time. Uh, you can start to establish roles for them. Uh, once they have a role that they feel is meaningful. Um, that culture will come together on its own. So I, I'm not sure if I answered your question. It's really hard. Uh, culture, I believe, is the most difficult piece uh, to build within a team. Uh, you can teach anybody how to pass or set or hit, but teaching kids how to be good teammates uh, is really, really tough. Teaching kids how to be good teammates that sit on the bench while their teammates are playing is even tougher. Uh, if they can get some self-satisfaction out of being on the bench uh, and being in a support role, uh, if you have those kids on your team, uh, you're in real good shape. Okay, uh, hopefully I answered your, your question, Felix. Uh, I, the other thing I think is awesome with 13U uh, is they're fresh. They don't have any of the, the jaded politics that some of the older kids will have. The, the parents don't really know. Uh, it won't be until 15U when you get rid of fair play. Uh, that you're going to start to see some of those things uh, really engage in your team. Uh, I would say that's a much more difficult uh, spot than at 13 u to build that culture. Uh, Stephen Hone asks, what are some strategies for supporting players who are not getting playing time and may be resentful uh, and causing concerns? I, again, get them a role. Uh, what is their role in the team? Make sure that they know what they need to do to earn more playing time. Um, not sure what age group you're coaching, Stephen, but uh, I, I would also say if you took them on your team at the club level, they should probably play a bit. Uh, and not, I don't believe at all in kids sitting on a bench for an entire tournament. 
Uh, in fact, the the photo that's there of you got of my uh, Fanshawe women's team at nationals last year. Uh, all 14 of our players on the roster got into the OCAA gold medal match, and all 15 players got into a match, at least part of a match at CCAA championships. So there has to be a way to get them a meaningful role, whether that's as a serving specialist, it's a, a passing specialist, have to do something well because you chose to put them on your team, right? So that would be my, my advice there. Uh, and then the next question, looks like the last one so far, is Michael Amachin. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Uh, are there any specific tools you use to build trust with your athletes, or is it uh, that encompassing within the conversation pieces and personal actions uh, and reactions to the players' needs? Uh, I'd say it's a good combination of both. Um, I ask my players to be learning all the time. Um, so if they see that I'm always taking courses, always going to different camps to work with different coaches to, to learn from, um, they're naturally going to go, okay, well, this is a learning environment, so I have to learn a little bit more. If I'm constantly uh, tearing down, berating, making fun of my players, I, and I'm, I'm a, a bit of a joker, I like to laugh and joke with my players, but there's a line there. If I'm constantly making them feel like they don't have value, then they're not going to, to have that trust. Uh, if something happens, so you can see in the photo uh, that's on the screen right now, the young lady in the middle uh, in the wheelchair, uh, she blew her ACL, MCL, uh, and meniscus in our quarterfinal match uh, nationals. We also lost our starting setter, um, who I don't know if you guys can see my point or not, but is back here. So she's not actually in her uniform right now. She dislocated her shoulder completely in that quarterfinal. Um, so you have to be able to, to let them know that you have their back, that things are okay. Somebody had to replace those two in the match uh, for the rest of the tournament. So in the OC or in the CCAA, we have a backdoor bronze. After losing our quarter, we had to play a bronze quarter. I had to put my backup right side, who was ready to play right side in the morning, into set. She was also our backup setter, which means that our third string right side was playing on the right side. If they don't trust that I have the confidence in them because I've shown that confidence throughout the year to give them playing time at some point, they're not ready to play and they don't play as well as they did, right? So it is partially over time you build that trust by your actions uh, and it is partially, it can be, you know, a one-time thing happens and, you know, you go and you take care of them. Uh, and there are team building activities, trust falls. Uh, you know, if you're going to do trust falls or you're going to do trust throws or whatever, uh, stuff like that, they have to belay each other if you're rock climbing. That was one of our early year uh, team building activities. Um, they need to know that you have their back, that you're going to take care of them. Um, and for me at Fanshawe, I was a little different than you guys. Uh, I had to watch their backs for academics. How uh, to take care of their nutritional needs for the first year players that are uh, in residence. You don't have those same uh, responsibilities, um, but there are still things that we can do that show that we genuinely care about those athletes. So uh, hopefully I answered that question. Um, those are all the questions that I have so far. So uh, not sure what Kelvin wants to do here, but if there are more questions, I'm I'm here. Um, okay, Calvin says that's it. So thanks, guys. I appreciate you listening. Um, hopefully you got something out of it that you can take back and use. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you guys on the court. Thank you.